One of the laws that we introduced in our early discussion of networks was that protocol layers are intended to talk to peer layers. Layer 7 on one machine talks to layer 7 on the other machine. Layer 6 on one machine talks to layer 6 on the other machine. And the way in which this works is that the data message that moves down the protocol stack typically gets headers, pre-pended, at every layer. And then when at the receiving end the message moves up the protocol stack, those headers are interpreted and uh, used to uh, determine how information is sent to a higher layer. Thus far, while talking about layer 6, the presentation layer, we've really been talking about how characters are represented. Uh, we've been silent about how this information about the encoding or the presentation of information can be added in a header that can be meaningfully interpreted at the receiving end of the communication. This video is a first attempt to talk about how headers are indeed used uh, while uh, communicating on layer 6. The first context in which it was realized that other types of data had to be transmitted than textual data and occasional binary data was in email systems. People wanted to send all sorts of traffic via attachments or in other uh, formats associated with emails. For that reason, the multipurpose Internet Mail Extension Protocol, or MIME Protocol, was developed. Um, on the screen, you can see a list of common examples of data types or of MIME types that are uh, available. This comes from uh, Wikipedia. This is just a list of examples. It's not an exhaustive list. Uh, zooming in, you can see that there are all sorts of um, types that are associated with various applications. Perhaps more interesting for our current purposes is that uh, provision is made for various types of text, for example, text plane or text, uh, text HTML, um, and also for images, uh, images in JPEG format and images in GIF format. So the basic idea was that one could specify somewhere, and exactly where we'll see just now, that what was being transmitted was intended to be encoded or of this particular type. The actual encoding was something separate that also in many cases needed or still needs to be specified. So uh, let's you look at a couple of examples to illustrate this point a bit more clearly. Um, there's a command uh, with a name, name MIME type. And uh, what I can do is, on this Linux machine, look at various ex examples that I have. For example, I have a sample.html uh, HTM file uh, that is uh, available on the system. And if I ask the MIME type of that, it tells me that that is, as I would have expected, a text slash HTML. Um, in the same manner, I can ask it about a doc or a docx file and it tells me that this is of type application, subtype MS Word. Um, PDF provides me with a similar example, application slash PDF. And then to give it something a bit more interesting, um, for a tech file, I can ask it about uh, my sample.tech 
and you can see that it sticks slash x dash tag. Now that x dash uh, is is something that is uh, beginning to be phased out. Um, so we'll have to see how that develops in future. And one uh, question that you probably have at this point is whether this MIME type uh, program doesn't simply look at the extension. But what we can very easily do is say, let's copy sample.html to just a file called X. Uh, and if I ask about the MIME type of this file X, it still knows that it's a text slash HTML file. If I remove the file X and I copy, let's say, sample.doc to X and I ask it about the MIME type of X, then it tells me it's application image word. So this does a somewhat deeper inspection of the file, doesn't merely look at the extension, and it provides you with a MIME type. So in, in this way, you can begin to get a feeling for how the, these files are, are encoded, uh, or rather what content they contain. When we talk about the actual encoding, we need to be a bit more specific. As you've seen with characters, we have ASCII and Unicode and the various ISO standards, and they can all be used to represent characters. So it's all fine to say that this is text slash HTML, but we need to ask the question, uh, how do we know exactly how to encode the, the data? Now, let's look at the program that is called Wireshark. Wireshark is, on the one hand, an essential tool in the toolkit of anyone who runs a network or who wants to learn about networks. And therefore, you are encouraged to use this. On the other hand, uh, what Wireshark does is essentially wiretapping. And as you probably know, wiretapping is illegal. In, in fact, uh, if you want to see the details, you can go and look at the regulation of interception of communications and provision of communications information, uh, Communication Related Act of 2002, the so-called RICA Act. Um, now, you can look at the 2002 version. That act has also been declared unconstitutional uh, fairly recently, uh, in the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Court substituted some words in the Act and they instructed Parliament to change other words. So when you do look at this Act, it's perhaps important to, to find the, the most important version of it. Um, what it says, what is important for us, is that uh, one party consent is required in South Africa. So if I am a party to a conversation, then I am uh, allowed to intercept that communications. And the way in which most networks are built, you can uh, rest assured that the traffic that is sent to your computer is intended for you. However, if you were to run a, a small organization, then uh, it's possible for you to configure the network differently such that you're indeed able to intercept other people's information. And that would be illegal. So be very careful with what you do with a powerful tool such as Wireshark um, so that you do not uh, fall foul of the law. Now, let's look at how Wireshark is used. I have uh, Wireshark running on the screen in front of me. Uh, it uh, is quite a detailed uh, program, so uh, chances are that unless you're using a fairly big screen, you will not be able to see the details. But let's try and guide you through what I'm doing. Uh, fairly close to the top, 
you can see that I have applied a filter there on the green line and the filter tells me that I only want to capture HTTP traffic or actually that I only want to see HTTP traffic being captured. Now if I activate capturing and that I do by clicking on that shark fin, the blue shark fin that is in the upper left hand corner. If I click on that, it starts recording and I've previously captured some data. So I'm just going to say, forget whatever I captured uh, and start a new capture. If I did not have the HTTP filter in, you would now see traffic streaming across my screen. But uh, there's very little HTTP traffic running in this network. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create an HTTP request and um, going to my browser and I'm simply going to ask you to go to HTTP and one of the machines in my local network. So uh, I'm not going to uh, go outside. I'm definitely not going to capture anyone else's network. From the response that we're getting, you can see that there is an, a server running on that machine, but there's no content to display. If we go back to Wireshark, you will see that we have now captured two packets, uh, two HTTP packets, and I am going to click on the red stop button uh, to stop recording. I don't need to capture anything else for the time being. And um, the two packets that have been captured, the uh, first one is an HTTP and it is a GET request. And the next one is from the server back to me. Uh, it's the response to that request. If I click on my request that has gone out, you can see in this middle pane, um, a couple of lines. Let's quickly uh, point you to the bottom of the screen. You can see that there's all sorts of information in hexadecimal. That's the raw data that's been captured. But what is more important for us at the moment is what we see in this middle pane. Um, and what you do see there are essentially uh, the data interpreted on different layers of the protocol stack. So um, what you can see in the final line is the hypertext transfer protocol that happens to be running on the transmission protocol that run, happens to be running on the IP protocol and so on. These are all protocols that we will look at later. So for the time being, just note that they are being listed and that they are there to explore. Um, we are going to explore the hypertext transfer protocol. Uh, something else to keep in mind is that HTTP, as we previously said, is an application layer protocol. It's a layer 7 protocol, and we are currently talking about layer 6. But in the TCP IP protocol suite, no clear distinction is made between layers 5, 6, and 7. So you should expect some of the information about layer 6 to be embedded in the application layer. In the, in, in the protocol that we've just opened up. And um, on that particular line, which is a bit hard to enlarge, um, so I'll, I'll read to you what it says. It says that this request will accept text slash HTML. It will also accept application slash text HTML plus XML. It will also accept X application XML and a couple of other things on that line. And to, to really experience this, you have to capture your own traffic and, um, and, and see, look exactly at what it is willing to accept. Um, now, what we've seen there on that line is what is being accepted in terms of data types. Uh, there's also on the next line, what is being accepted in terms of encoding. 
and it tells me that it's willing to accept GZIP and deflate. So those are the two encodings that it's willing to accept. It's a bit strange because we are expecting text uh, here, but um, let's see what happens. You can also see on the third line that it talks about the languages that it will accept, and there is uh, a preference in this case for South African English, then for uh, South African Afrikaans, then for Afrikaans, then for Great British English, and finally for US English, and right at the end it says, if you don't have any of those, give me whatever you have. Uh, we're going to move to the response that we received from the server. And one of the interesting things to see there is that we've indeed re received something that is encoded as a gzip file. So some gzip contents. And if we uh, click on the line-based information, what is included in that, you will see that it is a text slash HTML, as we would have expected uh, to receive from this. And there is the, the page. Um, one of the things we can do to further explore this is click on any of the packets in this conversation, and then we can say, um, we want to follow it, and uh, we'll later explain why, but we're going to follow the TCP stream, and there is your uh, uh, entire conversation in a pinkish color at the top. You will see the request going out, and then in what has been received back, you will see information uh, that says that uh, we have received a content type, text slash HTML. It's also indicated that this uh, char sheet, this character sheet, is encoded using UTF-8. But you can higher up see this is encoded as GZIP. And if you look at the, the actual representation of what we received, you can see that looks nothing like the text we received. This is a GZIP version. It's a simple GZIP binary encoding. And uh, in that GZIP binary encoding, we have received the text uh, or the, 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 uh, the compacted text, uh, most probably to reduce the transmission time uh, that it has been uh, encoded. So, how does one get a text file to be gzipped? Any file for that matter, that's pretty easy. You just say gzip, and we still have our sample.html file, or htm file, that we had earlier, and I have just zipped it. Um, if you want to look at uh, the contents of the file, then hexdump is arguably the best tool we can use for that. Uh, given the screen resolution that I'm using here, uh, I will probably get a screen that doesn't make a lot of sense. So again, you should go and do this on your own, where you can use a smaller font and still be able to read it. But if we look at the hexadecimal representation of this file, then you can see there that it is compressed, that it contains, in essence, binary data. Um, and this uh, is exactly what was included in that data stream. Uh, uh, HTTP makes provision for the transmission of binary data. So the what we've just seen from our Wireshark example was that the textual data, the HTML code, was compressed into a binary format. But there are many pro uh, protocols where we have exactly the same or the exactly the opposite problem. Email, for example, was designed to transmit characters, character data. And uh, the challenge was, if you wanted to include, let's say, uh, 
uh, an image, a JPEG image, you could not simply include it as binary data. So somehow you had to translate it into uh, some form uh, in which it looked like text. And one of the most popular encodings for this is an encoding scheme that is known as Base64. In Base64, you use 6 out of the 8 bits to encode data. So with 6 bits, one gets 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 possible uh, uh, different characters to represent. Uh, so what one does is you take your binary data, you unpack it as one long stream of data, and then you sort of chop it up into six-bit quantities. And then every six bits is represented as a value that will definitely go through the email system. In fact, uh, it's a very interesting scheme that is used. Uh, those 64 values that are used happen to be the 26 uppercase lower letters, the 26 lowercase letters in the Latin alphabet, the 10 digits in the alphabet, uh, that takes you to 62, so you need two other characters, and uh, you can go and look at an HTT or a Base64 encoded file to, to see what that looks like. And... Um, uh, that will then uh, be translated, whatever binary file that you have, will be translated into blocks of characters that will definitely be able to pass through the file system. Uh, the command to uh, do this encoding is one that in days gone by long ago was called UU encode, Unix to Unix encode, and UUD code. Uh, after that, it became known as MIME encode. But it was realized that it's not really about MIME, it's about encoding. And now the most popular version of the command is simply known as Base64. So it tells you exactly what uh, the command does. Uh, what I have here is a tiny file and uh, called it x.txt. Uh, and you can see that that file consists of what looks like a single character, X. But we can go back to X dump and again uh, just double check what's going on in it. And what you can see there is that it actually consists of two characters. The 78, and if you go and look that up in the ASCII table, you will see that that's the X representation of X. And that is followed by a 0A. That's a line feed a character to indicate the end of line. So what we have here are actually two 8-bit characters uh, that are encoded in this file. If we now want to encode that as a base64 file uh, or base64 value, you can see that we are getting three printable characters out of that lowercase e, uppercase a, lowercase zero. And because your 8-bit translation to 6-bit strings do not always match up perfectly, you will get one or more equal signs at the end to show that there is some padding. Uh, the characters at the, right at the end should not be, or the bits right at the end of the encoding, should not be interpreted. So... Uh, to, to recap, uh, in the one case, we saw text data that was gzipped and transmitted via HTTP in binary. Here we are seeing something that happens to be a text character that we're looking at, but also a control character, the, the new line at the end. And they have both been translated to a character string that can be transmitted via the email system that is only used to, only able to transmit uh, textual data. Obviously, uh, if you go from an 8-bit encoding to a 6-bit encoding, the number of letters will include.
y.txt and you can see that that is an e with uh, diaresis. If I uh, look at the x dump of it, um, you can see again that the fourth character in that file is 0a, that's the line feed. And uh, before that, there are a couple of characters. So that E with the diuresis is encoded in uh, Unicode, UTF-8. And uh, I, I leave it up to you to go and decode this. But we have to return to our discussion of MIME types and the way that is used. And as a final example, I'm going to look at an email that uh, I dumped in raw format. Now, the same thing happens with email, that you get application-oriented data and presentation-oriented data that are thrown together into the same header. So there's a lot of information in this header that deal with, uh, with the actual transmission of the email. But one of the things that uh, is... Uh, of particular importance for, for us is the fact that we have a MIME specification in there. So it tells you that we're using MIME version 1.0. It tells us that the original encoding of this email was UTF-8. And it tells us that what we have in this email is content that happens to be of multi-part mixed nature. Now, multi-part always refers to a component that consists of subcomponents. And the mixed uh, subtype indicates that they have different types. And for the multi-parts, you will always get some boundary. And the boundary that is specified is just some random string of characters that is unlikely to occur anywhere else in this email. So if we go down in this email, then you will see the boundary there. So that marks the beginning of one of the parts. If you go down a little bit further, uh, you will see the boundary there. So that indicates another one of the parts and you will see the boundary again there so that indicates the end of these various parts. Uh, returning to our first part here, you can see that what we have here is a content type, plain text or text slash plain as a MIME type. And we have an indication here that this text happens to be encoded using UTF-8. So uh, this email doesn't really have the power to negotiate with the server as we saw in the HTTP example. Here you're simply sending the email away and you're saying this is how it's encoded and if somewhere along the line you're going to talk to a machine that won't understand this, you need to translate it to something that this program will understand. And uh, so when we send out this email, we quite simply say, this happens to be a plain text email encoded in UTF-8. And in that way, the email sender and the email receiver know how to interpret what follows. So what we have at the bottom of this email is simply plain text encoded using UTF-8. MIME types and subtypes and the character encoding associated with it or other type of encoding associated with it is not the only way in which two points that are communicating with one another can tell one another how the data will be represented. The next video will be the fourth and final video that deals with the presentation layer. And in it, we will consider other ways in which two communicating programs can also agree on how data is to be represented when it is transmitted between them. Music,